Hi, welcome to or welcome back to my channel. We are talking about my February wrap up. I had such a great reading month in February. I can't remember the last time I had such a good time reading all month long. I never really felt like I had a slump because like I wasn't enjoying something. Everything hit for the most part and the things that didn't I still had a pretty good time with. And honestly, what more can you ask for? So let's dive into the numbers for a second. So I read 15 books, and according to StoryGraph, that is 5,128 pages read, which is kind of wild, with an average rating of 4.43. Look, that is so high. I can't believe it. And honestly, that fits right in with my goals to read more books that I enjoyed. I told myself at the beginning of the year, I would absolutely love it if I have zero, one, or two star books by the end of the year, because that means that either was really good about DNFing or I was just really good about picking books out of the gate that I knew I would enjoy. And this month, it really hit. So let's go into the star breakdown. I had seven five star reads. I'm going to talk about all of them in this video. Two four and a half star four four star, one three and a half star, and one three star. I don't think I've ever had such a good month. So I'm going to just list off all the ones I've read and then I'll dive into them a bit deeper. Um, some of them you've already seen my commentary on from videos throughout the month and then there are some where I just didn't record a single bit of me reading them because I just wanted something for myself. And as you can tell by the star ratings, that worked out very well. So the first book of the month was Off the Beaten Path by Madison Wright. I gave that one four and a half stars and talked about it, I think, in my first video of the month. Then I read The End Zone by Aaron McKenzie. That was a brand new release, came out February 22nd. I gave that one four stars. Going Down by Cat Wynn was three stars. That one was a Valentine's novella. It was a super cute time. Then I read Icebound by Meredith Trap. That was five stars. I will talk about that more later. I waited a literal six months to read that book. And it was so wonderful. Stand and Defend by Sloan St. James was a wonderful surprise for me. That was also a five-star read. One where a, I think I saw it on either my TikTok for you page or an Instagram reel. And I'm so glad I did. Then I finally read Only for the Week by Natasha Bishop. I gave that one four stars. Had the best time. Puck Shy by Kayla Gross was another Valentine's novella. That one got four and a half stars for me. I read her Christmas novella which the name is escaping me, but I know a lot of people had problems with the conflict in that book. That was minimal in this one, and I'll talk more about it later. Possessive Heart by Brighton Walsh, five stars. Absolutely had the best time with that. For both her and Sloan St. James, I don't know how I've never read either of their series before, and that, of course, when I do read them, I pick up book like four in the series, but we'll talk more about that later. The Romantic Agenda by Claire Kahn was a nice surprise for me. That one got four stars as well. And then there's Shattered Vows by Shane Rose, also a four-star read. Butcher and Blackbird gave a five stars. I can't believe it took me so long to read that. I had the best time. We'll talk more about that in the next segment. Seduction of the Patriarch by Zoe Blake. I gave three and a half stars. I was revisiting this series. I don't think I'm going to talk about this book in depth. Um, this is one of those books where you look at it and you go, ooh, she was clearly in a depression spiral while she was just reading anything she could get her hands on, and you were correct. That's what happened when I read the first three books of that series. And then this one came up in conversation with somebody when they're talking about trying to read mafia adjacent dark romance. And I was like, oh, I read a series that was like that. Let me find it. And then I was telling them about that. And then I told them, I was like, mm, that was a dark period of 2023. I don't know if I could trust the quality of Rebecca's brain and review at that time. But here were my reviews of those books. And then I saw that the fourth one had come out like literally days before we had that conversation. So then I read it and... It was fine, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know? Alrighty, after that we have Swift and Saddled by Lila Sage. That one actually comes out on March 5th. Y'all are going to love it. So good. That's on Tuesday, actually. You guys are going to have the best time with that book. It is such a good time. After that, I read Pretty Rings and Broken Things by Kat Singleton. Gave that five stars as well. That came out February 22nd. Best time. Best time. And then I rounded out the month with a book I picked for my friend group's book club. It was my turn to pick the book. Five Star Read, Caught on Camera by Chelsea Curdo. Girl, I don't know what you put in that book, but I couldn't put it down. I could not put it down. I was reading on my lunch break, 
anytime I was like stuck on hold, I was like peeking at this book. I was having the best time. Five stars on notes. So those are all the books that I read this month. Let's dive into some specifics. Let's start with Stand and Defend. I don't know if I talked about this one on YouTube. I know I made a couple of TikToks during my reading experience of that one. This book, check the content warnings. Um, It starts out with Jordana, who prefers to go by Jordan, but her name changes a couple times in the book, and you'll understand why as you're reading it. She's in a relationship that is convenient for her parents. The guy is nice enough, but he's kind of verbally abusive to her, and he's a piece of shit, and she's supposed to get married to him. Then there's his best friend, Cam, who is a pro hockey player. He comes in town for, I think it's like a wedding shower or something. And then he kind of sees an altercation happen between her and her soon-to-be groom. And he's like, are you good? And she's like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Like, he's just agitated or whatever. But Cam was raised in an abusive household. And his mom, once she was able to leave his dad, gets married to this guy that, like, he thinks is great. They started a foundation to help women escape domestic violence situations and like to support them through it. So he's very aware of what that looks like. But he also knows like you can't press someone who's not ready to leave or not ready to acknowledge their situation. So he just kind of says to her like, okay, but just know like you can say something to me if something's going on. Through a course of events, they end up together and he tells her like, hey, the safest place for you right now is probably my house because he, I believe, lives in a gated community. His home is definitely gated, and he's, like, a really good security system. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to be on the road for hockey, but, like, it would be hard for him to get to you here, and we can make sure he doesn't know you're here. And so that's what happens, and then forced proximity happens, and feelings, and sexy times, and there's also a good-for-you girl revenge subplot that happens that's just... mm, It was a good time. It was a good time. If domestic violence situations aren't hard for you to read on page, or even if they are, I appreciated that these were very short when they happened. And if it's tough for you, like you could very easily skim it and just kind of mentally know that something happened and just kind of move on. Because I would say, at least from someone who does not have a trauma response to that, I would say only one of the scenes really got my heart racing where I was like, oh shit. And it's a good outcome in that scene. I, I'll say that, not to you know be spoiler heavy, but if you wanted to read it, there are some very steamy reels that have been posted about this book um, that I know have piqued a lot of people's interest. But if that is the thing that's hard for you, know that it's good outcomes basically all around um, in this book. The next one I want to talk about is Only for the Week by Natasha Bishop. I had been searching for not only a romance book, but a black romance book where both people in the relationship are black. There is nothing against interracial relationships, not against it. But I was looking for this very specific thing and I found it in Only for the Week with Natasha Bishop. Rome, the man that you are, I, that book boyfriend perfection, honestly. So let me tell you about how this all goes down. Only for the Week is set in Tulum, Mexico, because the female main character, whose name I believe was Janelle, is there with Rome and the rest of the bridal party a week before the wedding starts, because it's a destination wedding, to kind of be there to just kind of relax and then also be there for, like, setup and everything. Her sister is the bride, so she's the maid of honor. The groom is her ex-boyfriend, which can make you have some pause but she very clearly states in the beginning of this book like we didn't have chemistry it was like dating a bro like just a friend who i would love to go and sit and watch games with or like go to a thing with but i we just their chemistry wasn't there i do not want this man and watching him with my sister i go wow they're great together yes please be together But everybody's treating her like this is the hardest thing for her and like with kid gloves and she's just like, are y'all not listening to me? Like, I don't want that man and I like him with my sister. Like, they make each other happy. I don't understand why you guys are making this such a big deal. And Rome is the only one to really treat her like she's an adult who knows her own mind. Like, there are a couple moments where he's like, are you sure you're okay? But it's not even really because of 
the fact that her sister's marrying her ex, but it's the way her sisters are treating her in certain moments. I fucking hated her sister, if I'm being very honest. Um, and you probably will too, if you read this book and if you've read it, like, you know, like that girl was awful, absolutely awful, but he just shows up for her and he's always had feelings for her so much so that when she was dating his best friend, who's the groom, when they were dating and he met her, he was like, Oh, I could not be a good friend to him and be around her because I want her. So he makes himself scarce. They had like game nights in their like friend group. He wouldn't show up. His job has an opportunity for him to go work out in California. And he's like, and for me to not risk my friendship and risk it all for this girl. Absolutely. I'm going to California. Disappears. Doesn't see her. So when they're back all together at this, you know, pre-wedding week situation, he's like, well, she's single. I'm single. If the opportunity arises... And he, I forget how they get together, but they do, they have a fantastic time, but she's like, this is just for the week. Like, this is not going beyond this. My sister's not going to react well to this, which like, I don't understand why, if I'm being very honest, like there's no good reason for them to have the reaction. Most of the book, honestly, was her dealing with her sister's awful behavior. And then her mom comes into town for the wedding and her, and you can very clearly see where her sister gets it from. And, and it's him supporting her through all of that without trying to fully take over. Like, there are some moments where he steps up for her, which I appreciated. And then there are moments where he tries to step up for her, and she's like, no, I got it. And he just steps back. No bruises to his ego. And he's just like, you got a girl? Like, I'm, but I'm right here. Like, if you decide you want some support, I'm standing literally right here. Or I'm down the hall or whatever. He was great. I absolutely loved that, man. Absolutely loved it. So let's take a little pit stop into the Valentine's Day novella that I read. Well, one of them. And that was Puck Shy by Kayla Gross. The first book was called Trick Shot. And the conflict that happened in that book really rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, including me. It just felt really immature and stupid given the ages of these people involved. And some of the other things that were happening, it was just like, why would you do that? It didn't make any sense. And so I was a little worried going into this one that there's potential for it because The main male character in this book is the twin to one of the main male characters of the first book. And so for a number of reasons, it could be a problem. He's also a famous hockey player. And then the female main character in this one, I don't know if she's the twin to the female main character of the first one or if they just look a lot alike, but they are sisters. They run into each other at a sex club, but it's like a masquerade night. He has no idea who she is, but she knows exactly who he is. But because of the setting they're in, she doesn't say anything about it because she doesn't want to like make him uncomfortable or like draw a bunch of attention to him. But people will like look, his physical build, you're like, that's an athlete. Like, you know, that's an athlete. And then being where they are, it's just not hard to deduce. They have this very sexy voyeuristic time. Very hot opening scenes. And then a couple days later, her sister and her partners are in town for one of his games. Because again, her sister is dating his brother. And her sister's like, come to the game. And she's like, I can't, I have to work, whatever. And she's like, then come out with us after. And she's like, okay, but she doesn't really want to because she knows, number one, if she goes... She's going to see her sister's boyfriend who looks exactly like the guy who she just hooked up with because they are identical twins. And she's like, obviously, I'm not going to be pining for my sister's boyfriend, but it's nonstop real playing in my head of that night. Two, her hookup's brother's in town and like they don't see each other that often, I don't think, but they see each other often enough. But she's like, he's going to go. Like, he's going to be there. And then I'm going to run into him. And then she's like, am I going to explain who I am? Am I going to explain the situation? Am I not? I don't know. And she's kind of freaking out, but then she goes anyway. That man walks into that bar. He takes one look at her, calls her the name he called her the night before because they weren't using their real names. And she's like, oh shit, he knows exactly who I am. And this is where the chance for the same conflict to happen from the first book could happen here. But immediately they nix that in the bud. They go off separately together. and He's like, we need to talk. Immediately they clear the air and then it's just like nothing. Like it's fine. I so appreciated that. That's what I wanted out of the first book. And that's why this one got four and a half stars for me. Their chemistry was phenomenal. She worked at that sex club. And it was a thing she wasn't willing to give up. And I really appreciated how he was so cool with that. 
like he was like, I don't really care if you want to continue that, but I am very serious about wanting to be with you. But I would prefer if like I was just involved when that's happening. And she was like, game, down, let's have a good time. It was cute, it was smutty. It was a cute, smutty, good time. Then I read Possessive Heart by Brighton Walsh. And um, that was hot. That was hot. I couldn't put that book down, honestly. It is a brother's best friend, but secret hookup situation. So the premise is every time he's home on either a break from the sport, whether that's like the all-star break or, you know, it's off season for hockey. If he's home, like they're hooking up. Nobody knows about this. And then another conflict happens and they don't speak for over a year. And she feels kind of like ghosted by him at this point and is pissed, absolutely pissed. He gets injured and he decides he's gonna go home to his hometown to rehab. At some point they get snowed in at the mansion he had built right outside of town. He conveniently has like her favorite ice cream and all her favorite snacks and her favorite wine and whatever. And she's like, what the fuck? She didn't know it was his house to begin with. She thinks she's going up there, I think, to talk about a sponsorship for the lodge that she runs with her brothers. It's a whole thing. I'm having I'm having the hardest time explaining this because realistically, this book had some plot, but the plot was smashing. That was the plot, if we're being very honest. So it's hard to keep all the details together. A sexy time, a very sexy time. If the, oh no, your brother found out moment is one that you like have a love-hate relationship with. In this case, I think it was handled very well. She retained all autonomy, in my opinion, in this uh, situation, if I'm remembering correctly. Because that's usually what makes people kind of hate that is the brother finds out and then he acts like she doesn't have a brain or had no decisions in this and doesn't let her speak and, you know, like whisks her off to wherever. And that did not happen at all, which I really appreciated. Like, he was upset, but it wasn't... It didn't escalate to where it can sometimes in these books and it felt fairly realistic to me. I had a great time. I would recommend that one to really anyone. I think I am going to go back and reread, or not reread, read for the first time the rest of that series. Because again, I jumped in at like book five, which is fairly late. But I had a really good time with those characters and like the found family that's there. It seemed really sweet. Let's talk about Switch and Saddled by Lila Sage. I loved that book. It was a very different tonally from Done and Dusted, which makes sense because Done and Dusted was a brother's best friend romance where the two characters had a ton of history with each other, so you immediately felt like you were just in this, even though at times tension-filled, but fairly warm setup. With Swift and Saddled, it's the opposite of that. They're strangers. And it starts off with just a very steamy setup. Ada comes into town. She's supposed to be renovating the what used to be the big house on Rebel Blue Ranch and is now just like this dilapidated structure that they want to turn back into a guest lodge so that they can bring in some more money onto the ranch. And Wes, it's his passion project. It's all he's ever wanted. And he's finally getting the chance to do it. And then Wes is our mailman character. He works on the ranch and he's always just kind of felt like he's just Wes. Emmy has her barrel racing and she's teaching kids how to ride. Gus is very much the heir apparent to take over Rebel Blue when their dad retires and he's already kind of stepping back from that and Wes just feels kind of just he's the middle child and he very much feels that way. He feels loved by his family. He doesn't feel like they take him for granted or anything but he just feels like I'm just here. I'm just Wes. And then in walks Ada into I forget the name of the town bar but she comes into town it's like 10 p.m. she hasn't eaten anything and she's looking on google and they're like oh you can get food here there is no food in that bar bartender hands her a pack of like dusty ass Doritos from god knows how long else and she's sitting there eating them and she makes eye contact with Wes across the bar and doesn't know who he is and that he's soon to be her boss and they have instant chemistry. He can't keep his eyes off of her. They're making out in the back hallway. They're about to like fully just dive in and get it on. And then Brooks, the bartender, comes back because he needs to get into the office. And he's like, y'all can keep doing what you're doing. Just do it against the other wall so I can walk into my office. And Ada sprints out after that and like leaves. Next day, she shows up on Rebel Blue to start her job. And lo and behold, there is Wes ready to show her how to do her job, where she's going to be. And she's like, oh, fuck. Okay. 
And they basically immediately decide, okay, we're just gonna pretend like that that didn't happen and move on. But the chemistry is there. The he is immediately pining for her. Her, I won't. She acknowledges that he's attractive and that obviously she felt something, but she doesn't have that immediate pining. She's just conflicted, I think. She also is coming off of a divorce. It's been a couple of years, but you can tell it's still weighing fairly heavy on her. And she's just dealing with the emotions of that because it was a kind of abusive situation. I don't know if he ever physically hurt her, but he definitely kept her isolated for sure. I think financially she didn't even have access to like a debit card. His car was the only one they had at the time and it was a stick shift that she didn't know how to drive. So if she couldn't go somewhere that was walking distance, like she just couldn't leave the house. And so she just felt very trapped. And so now she's trying to just regain her spirit in a way. And that is such a big part of the story. And Wes is just there to encourage her. Um, she becomes friends with his sister and her friend group. And it's the first time she's ever really had like girlfriends. And it was just so beautiful to watch her blossom into like who she actually is. And she's very much a person who, when things get hard, she runs. And maybe she doesn't completely lose the situation, but she definitely disappears for a while. And he knows that, and at times he just lets her. He's like, your brain's freaking out. Like, let your brain freak out, and then we'll talk about it after. It's fine. He was the best. I absolutely loved him. It is a swoony good time. 10 out of 10 recommend. So actually, before I read Swift and Saddled, I read Butcher and Blackbird and had the best time. I did do a video about this, but I have to talk about it again because I just loved it so much. Rowan and Sloane were a match made in heaven for each other in serial killer heaven. If you don't know, it is about two serial killers who are very like Dexter-esque about it. They take out the scum of the scummiest scum. There is nary a police detective <laughs> in this story, okay? There are, weirdly are no stakes when it comes to that. Their biggest stakes are trying to escape the people they're trying to kill before they get got when they're trying to get them. It's... The book is a little campy. It does not take itself seriously. And if you go into it knowing that, you will have a good time. You will have a good time. If you can get the audiobook, I can't recommend it enough. The guy who does Rowan's voice does the Irish accent and it's perfect. Had such a good time. It was the perfect mix of emotional, like, and not like deeply emotional, but like Sloan was, she had a lot going on and they let that happen throughout the book got very steamy at times. I love that Rowan had the best time watching her just be an absolute badass. It was great. It was absolutely great. Can't recommend it enough. And the last book I want to talk about is Caught on Camera by Chelsea Curdo. That book was so fun and so hot. It basically starts out with this woman is in her mid thirties. She's a pediatrician, I believe. And she is running this office that's like connected to a hospital and they're understaffed and just like having a lot of trouble and her guy friend comes in whose name I'm forgetting I think his name was Sean he comes in brings her like coffee and food sometimes and he's like hey like are you good like you're clearly like running yourself ragged here and they're friends he's the coach of the city's NFL team and used to play she's at one of his games with her best friend and his best friend and those two are dating and then a guy she's like on a first date with and the kiss cam lands on her and the guy she's dating, I'd say on the date with, they're not even really dating. This is the first date. And he's a whole dick about it. He's like, why are they doing this? This is a money grab or whatever. And the fans around them are like booing him. She's turning like red as a tomato. And it goes on and on. Like the camera person in the stadium keeps landing on them. It goes on like 10 or 12 times. It's very embarrassing for her. And eventually Sean's like, what the fuck is going on? Because he can tell like something's going on in the stadium, even though he's like on the sidelines. So he walks over, climbs up like the barrier wall, because they're like on the front, um, front row, and just kisses her. Kisses her senseless, right in front of the dude. And of course, they're gonna make headlines about the fact that an NFL head coach just walked over, climbed a barrier to kiss a random woman in the stadium, even though they don't know that they're already friends. And so they decide to use this newfound media circus to their advantage and fake date. She, the hospital she works at, like I mentioned, is in need of some funding and the NFL coach, uh, Sean, does a lot of charity work. So there's that. And then there, there's a charity dinner, I think, where they have like silent auctions and he agrees to 
do some like one-on-one coaching and like schmoozing or whatever as one of the donation items so that Lacey can impress her boss and then try to go for a promotion because she's trying to be the director of something I can't remember but she says he's always impressed by the person who brings the best silent auction item or experience or whatever there's no way he's not going to be impressed by me bagging an NFL coach showing up with him on my arm as my boyfriend and then also him donating his time like there's no way that that's not going to get me this promotion and then Sean has been dealing with his mom (laughs) And sisters being like, when are you going to settle down? When are you going to bring a girl home? And he's going home for Christmas. And so he's like, Lacey, come home for Christmas with me. Put on a show. And then at New Year's, we will break up for the world to see. And it'll be, you know, we'll we'll move on. And at that point, she should have had the chance at her promotion. And then he will have appeased his mom and gone home. He's 40. And then she's, I think, 33, 35, somewhere in there. My favorite thing about this book is that they acted their age. And I know what you're saying. You're like, Rebecca, like, isn't that a given? No, it's not. There are plenty of romance novels that claim that they are written with, you know, characters that are in their, like, 30s, 40s, middle age, and then they proceed to write them with, like, 21-year-old brains, and you're just like, what the fuck is going on? Like, why are you doing this to me? That does not happen at all in this book. At all. At one point, they decide consensually that they're going to hook up and just kind of have one night together and get it out of the systems, which we all know is not how that works. And Sean's like, fine, if I only get to fuck you once, like, it's going to be the best thing that's ever happened to you. And that man turns her out. She And she, like, later she's like, why did I say only one night? Why did I do this to myself? And obviously things progress from there. It is a steamy good time, but it's also very emotional. She really struggles with the fact that she feels like she can't, not that she can't date, but she just dates a bunch of duds because guys are intimidated by the fact of that only the size of her paycheck, but of her confidence and just who she is and that she knows who she is and that she's very happy with her life. And none of them can seemingly add to that and that makes them insecure little boys and she really hates that. And then Sean is also kind of in a similar spot. He is dealing with, just a lot of loneliness but doesn't really realize it until him and Lacey start this fake dating and he realizes like how nice it is to come home to someone sometimes or like after a tough game like they're texting or whatever and she's just like hey like it's one game it's gonna be fine like you guys are good you're gonna have a good time and there are all these moments that are set up because of their fake dating for them to be together and he's just realizing like damn I have been alone for a long time and he's dated but it just hasn't you know ever really panned out for him He also is dealing with a lot of anxiety as well and she helps him a lot through that and like immediately picks up when he's like oh yeah like after a game whether it was tough or not sometimes all I need is silence some classical music a slow drive back to my apartment like a whiskey and just sit on the couch and after like a tough game he goes to her place instead and he's like what is that and she's like oh I put classical music on because I know you would just want to sit on the couch and just kind of deal for a little bit. And it was just very sweet, and they did a lot of that for each other. As I mentioned before, she's overworked. He regularly sends her lunch or shows up with it, and he's like, hey, like, you need to slow down. You need to take care of yourself. Like, you can't burn out. But he never tells her to, like, just stop in general. He's just like, just pause. Pause enough to take care of yourself and then go back to the thing you love. But you can't give from an empty cup, essentially. And he was just so great about that. The whole time, you're just swooning over them. And you're waiting for them to realize that they're in love with each other. And they realize it around the same time. But it doesn't feel insta-lovey, even though they were only together technically in this book, I think over the course of like six weeks, which is not a long time. But they had been active, present friends in each other's lives for like two years before this. And he realizes like, oh shit, I've liked her this whole time and just didn't really realize it. They have great banter. They're always ribbing with each other. It's such a fun time. So I can't recommend that book enough. And the next one in the series comes out this month, actually. And I think it's called Behind the Camera. And it's going to be a, like, single dad nanny situation. The I believe he's the quarterback that Sean coaches is the main line character. And then Maven, who's Sean's goddaughter, who turned 18 in this book, I think she's a little older in the next book, is the nanny. And then they, you know, get together. So it's a great time. So those are all the books that I read this month. A few reviews for you. If you're curious about my thoughts on the rest of them, check out some of the videos from February. And my Goodreads is also linked in the description below so you can see full reviews of everything. And I will see you guys in another video soon.